Hi, everybody. My name is Natalie Yeadon. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Impetus Digital. At Impetus Digital, we have built some of the best in class, asynchronous and synchronous virtual collaboration and communication tools. We have been working with life science companies from across the globe over the past 13 years to help them with all kinds of things, including virtual advisory boards, online medical education, virtual investigator meetings, and everything in between. And since the launch of our award-winning Insight Events platform, we've been helping pharma companies with large corporate events, innovation hackathons, sales and MSL training, and all other really interesting virtual uh, events as well. But more importantly at Impetus, we really believe that everything starts with a conversation. And from these big, hairy, audacious conversations with some of the leading edge thinkers, the digital provocateurs, the healthcare thought leaders, we can all work to collectively and positively disrupt healthcare. So I'm super excited to having one of these thought leaders at the table with me today. This is actually Raphael Rakowski. He's actually the executive chairman, um, chief development officer and co-founder of Medically Home. Really excited about this. So I can't wait to dig into this. It's a really cool company. Um, they're pioneering the world's first virtual hospital. So needed and so timely. He's an American entrepreneur, investor and healthcare industry veteran. Raphael has um, over 30 year career in sales engineering, process control consulting, and several entrepreneurial startups in healthcare services, as well as renewable energy. He is a public speaker and an advocate for changes to the American healthcare system. Among his other business ventures, Raphael was the CEO of American Healthways, as well as co founded Intersection Partners which launched a series of healthcare services businesses, including Clinically Home, the predecessor model to the Medically Home Group. Raphael is a graduate of Lehman College and currently resides in Stamford, Connecticut. Welcome Raphael, so happy to have you on the show. Thank you, Natalie, nice to be here. Absolutely, very interesting and very colorful background history Love to dig in and find out if you can give us a summary of your career, the trajectory you took, and how you landed in the place that you are today. Um, I imagine it's just been more of um, opportunistic and and being willing willing and open to be guided rather than having a plan because I didn't have a plan for my career. Started in engineering and um, got really comfortable with um, developing new ways to think about manufacturing. And that was the earliest part of my career. Lived and, and worked all over the world and redesigned factories, mostly large scale production processes, everything from automobiles to food to primary metals, paint. Uh, did about 212 factories during that period of time. And what I discovered was that every system, manufacturing system, when it was originally designed, was very um, integrated, uh, holistic. All of the thoughts around materials, machinery, labor all integrated over time as the company and the plant iterated, it lost its integration and it became more of a siloed operation. And that was really the first spark of understanding that when you build a system, any kind of system over time, it iterates and in the iteration, it loses its integrity. So that those were the early days. Uh, back in the day, I put salad in a bag and that was my first uh, venture in California. And then from there, I started an incubator uh, where I would develop new business ideas in partnership with large global brands. One of them was with DuPont Consumer Health, which led to a company called Empower Health, which was intended to identify patients that were on a trajectory to having a medical episode. In other words, uh, either not ad adherent to standards of care or having other issues, a lot of them socially determined. And that led to a company that I merged with um, public company called American Healthways. I ended up becoming president, not CEO of American Healthways. That was a public company. We enjoyed significant amount of success and growth. Uh, ultimately had 3 million patients under our care. And that's when I really learned about the, the driving challenges that patients and families have with the social issues that really drive their health. It's not that they don't know what to do. It's that they really don't have uh, the wherewithal in many cases to do what they know they need to do. And that was a, a business that was, was founded around the command center with clinicians centralized to, to deliver and support care of patients that were remote. And that's kind of the first step in the evolution of merging my thinking and 
and work in engineering with my thinking and work in healthcare. Along the way, I uh, had some success with American Healthways. Along the way, I did a number of other ventures, started a number of other companies in the, in the um, basically in the, in the environmental area. That's a big passion of mine. I believe the earth and the people that are on the earth are a single ecosystem. You can't separate them. So to me, healthcare and, and ecology are the same thing, just expressed differently. Uh, and then about 13 years ago, I was joining the board of an academic medical center. My friend had the board seat there and, and I was gonna take that seat. And just by coincidence, my father was admitted to that hospital while I was going through the interview process. And unfortunately he lost his life from three medical errors while I was going through the interview process. And that's how Clinically Home was born, which was the predecessor company of Medically Home. And the root cause exploration I did <clears throat> around that was I didn't know that 65% of the cost of a hospital stay was bricks and mortar overhead, which leaves only 35% for actual medical care for patients, which is inadequate, which causes a hospital reliably to rush the patient through the process because they really can't generate a profit margin after four and a half or five days in the hospital. So a lot of the processes that hospitals adopted starting about 30 years ago were industrial processes. You know, words like workflow, handoffs, transfers, those are industrial terms. Those are not terms that we traditionally would think of as terms associated with healing people that are sick. Those are things you think about when you're making a transmission for a Chevrolet, not when a human being is sick. And that was old territory for me, very familiar with the industrialization and processes. And it just felt completely wrong to me. Um, I had a lot of personal issues with my parents' health. Both of my parents were Holocaust survivors. Uh, three different concentration camps, six years, and my brother passed away of Tay-Sachs disease, and then my mother had a whole series of miscarriages after he passed. So health, uh, suffering, pain was a big part of my, my childhood, a big part of growing up. So I integrated all of these thoughts around what happened to my dad in the hospital, my background in engineering, my experience with my parents at home, and the thought popped up, why not move all the care out of the hospital, move it to the home, and in essence, um, take the 65% that we're spending on the buildings and provide much more care over a much longer period of time in a site that patients preferred, which is the home. And this was exactly 13 years ago. The number of issues, Natalie, to actually do that idea were formidable, uh, not the least of which were logistics, software, technology, uh, but the biggest part of it was not that there was no payment, there was no regulatory framework. The biggest part was the commitment to get it done and the willingness to stay with it until it actually became a, a viable way to deliver care. Uh, at the time, I had a close relationship with Bruce Leff. He's a physician at Hopkins. He's the father of hospital home research. And he convinced me that the, the benefits to patients are real. They sleep better, they less infections, they fall less cognitive decline is, is, is reduced, mortality and morbidity is reduced. Every clinical measure is beneficially improved in the home setting. And that conversation with Bruce that was 13 years ago really had a big impact on me. So we set out to create the worst, world's first virtual hospital, but the real idea, Natalie, was never a virtual hospital. It was to decentralize care. Thinking of Amazon as a very specific and easy example to relate to, they decentralized retail. They took all of the retail that used to be in stores making you know, customers come to the store and they moved the products and the model to patients, excuse me, to consumers' homes in the same way it's, it was my view, it still is my view that we don't need to make patients come to doctor's offices. We don't need to make patients come to hospitals. We can come to them and logistics and the technology is now in place to do that. So the model was decentralizing care delivery with the first kind of overt ex expression of that would be virtual hospital care at home. From the emergency department to the med surge floor, to specialty care, to cancer care, to clinical trials, all brought to the patient at home. So that's the short version of about 13 years of work. Wow, and I have to tell you, I am incredibly impressed by it. I mean, first of all, that th this was a vision, because I mean, this is chunky. I mean, lots of people, when you talk about complex systems and you talk about innovations thinking, they're usually taking a small piece of that yarn, you know, that bundle of yarn that's all raveled up together to try to fix something. This is chunky. This is big. How did you 
and I know that you were mad. So like, we're going to try to you know dismantle this a little bit so we can understand the, the complexity of taking on something as robust as decentralizing sort of, you know, hospital hospitalization and all of the care that happens in the healthcare space that are, that is away from home. So love the fact that you shared with us the inspiration behind this. Tell us a little bit about the journey. What were some of the first pickings, the things that brought you to where you are today? What were some of the first things that you started to um, peck away at? So we made a list. Um, we call it the Diet Coke list. My, one of my partners and I, he's now our CEO. Um, and it was called the Diet Coke list because it took us about 12 Diet Cokes in two days in a, <laughs> in a, in a video conference to make the list. And the list were, was 186 deep of all the things that currently were not possible to enable this model. It was a big list. Um, and one thought was, why don't we go pick at the list one thing at a time? But that wasn't going to work because everything on the list was integrated with the other 185 things. So how do you attack this? And, and the thought was, and it was really more a, a, a gut instinct, was to actually talk to the market, go sell this idea. And whoever pushed back and however they pushed back, those are the things to focus on. Instead of it being the initial pickings or the low lying fruit, these are the first reactions the market had to the idea. So our, our thesis was whatever people push back on earliest is the thing we need to solve for first. Mm -hmm. So we were thrown out of, I don't remember, 30 systems, health systems who threw us out. And these are friends of mine who ran them. And they said, you know, what a great idea, intriguing, incredibly elegant, great for patients, but we're in the business of filling beds with heads and we don't make money by taking them out of the house, regardless of the, the, you know, the merit of your idea, the business behind it, it doesn't make any sense. So the first thing we did, Natalie, was we collected, I don't remember the exact number, about 250,000-ish individual hospital admissions across multiple health systems. And for each admission, we literally went through how many times did the nurse touch the patient? What medication did they get? How long was the doctor with them? Was the family able to contact them? The physician. And basically the entire patient journey for 250,000 patients, we microscopically diagnosed. And, and we obviously discovered the costs, we discovered all the clinical interventions, but more importantly, we got a good understanding of what the patient experience was. And then what we asked ourselves was, if we did that x-ray in the hospital that cost $300 in the home, what would it cost? If we spent 30 days with the patient instead of four, what would it cost? If we don't have the overhead of a hospital, how much do we save? If we had to put technology in the home to monitor the patient as if they were in a telemetry unit, what would it cost? How would we do it? So we use those 250,000 admissions as the benchmark of what we wanted to transform. And that was the first step. And that was, I don't know, eight years ago. Um, and when we discovered, which has held true, that the savings of moving the patient to the home from the hospital, it's about 25%. Um, mm. And I could go into the details of that, but that hasn't changed. But it makes sense, 65% of the cost of care is the hospital's overhead. When you remove the hospital's overhead, there's 65% savings right there. But if you provide more care over a longer period of time and you're doing it in a decentralized way, meaning that people have to come to the home, it costs tax for that. When you balance the positives and the negatives and costs, you end up with about a 27% savings, which has held up uh, all these years. So anyway, that was the first thing we did. We've done many other things um, around the model, but the second big development, I think that's worth mentioning is um, I'm, I'm much older than you, but you don't probably remember the movie, The Graduate with Dustin Hoffman, if you've seen it or I not seen it. I absolutely do. All right, well, there was a scene, <laughs> there was a scene at his party, his graduation party where Dustin Hoffman was standing by the pool and one of his parents' friends came over to him and he was a little drunk, said plastics. And, and he was just trying to explain at the time, one of the greatest industries to go into if you're a young graduate of college is, is to go into plastics. So I remember that scene. And then one night we had an incident with a nurse. Um, she was coming off of her shift. She didn't want to go to a, a patient's home that had urinary retention and needed a, a Foley catheter fast. And if you've ever had urinary retention, it is a, an issue that requires really, really rapid response. In any event, um, the fact that she was on a shift process that was 
designed for basically scheduling home health, meaning I know I need a nurse to do an assessment tomorrow. I know I need a nurse to do wound care tomorrow. They were never designed. The whole system was never designed for rapid response. And that night we went out, my partners and I went out for dinner. And then we literally said, what do we do with this? This is really, really troubling. And this was back in the day. And we said, plastics. And everyone looked at me, <laughs> what do you mean? I said, no, not plastics, paramedics, paramedics. And that, that was the biggest spark that changed everything. They are rapid, they are reliable. And unlike nurses, they can be scheduled within minutes. Um, and that was another, I mean, there were hundreds of things that happened in the early days, but that moment, that night, that urinary retention experience drove us to paramedicine. And we've, got, we've become a leader in the use of paramedics and EMTs in our model of care. So anyway, there's many, many, many stories, but those two, the 250,000 diagnosed admissions under a microscope and the, and the conversion from nurses to paramedics as the first responders to the home changed everything. I love it. There's just so much to dig in here. I literally could speak to you for hours on this, but there's some really important key components of what makes the virtual hospital and what you have created so successful. And a core component has to do with the technology, the, con the conversation, the way information is being relayed back and forth between a patient's home and whoever the caregivers. So tell us a little bit about this medical command center. What is it and who's involved and how does it work? Yeah, so the only way to explain the medical command center is to explain the ecosystem that the medical command center is part of to understand why there is a medical command center. And then when I explain the ecosystem and, and everything in it, you'll understand the command center because there's many reference points. So let's start with the military medical model. So a, a soldier is injured in the field on the soldier's gear is a lot of the material needed to treat him in the event that he or she has had you know, an injury. And in the field is a medic <clears throat> with the soldier in battlefield theater. And that medic is connected now to a satellite phone, to a command center of physicians. That idea that you need to have somebody close by to the patient and that idea that that person in the field is not a trained doctor. You couldn't put tens of thousands of doctors in a battle theater. Instead, you put someone with enough training that's readily available, connected to the patients that becomes the hands, the eyes, and the ears of the doctor in the command center. So the first idea is tethering. So and we have a, a whole focus on how to tether. So in a tethering model, unlike a traditional medical model, the physician who's in the command center is actually doing the care using the field clinician. And, and many, many movies have been done, terrorist movies and other movies where the pilot becomes unconscious, the co-pilot gets poisoned and got stomach flu, and then the flight attendant comes in and there's somebody in the control tower telling her how to land the plane. That's the idea. The command center, the control tower is flying the plane using that flight attendant at the, at the control. That's the idea. So the command center is staffed with physicians, typically hospitalists, emergency room docs, and specialists, supported by nurses and APPs, nurse practitioners, and a whole series of resources we call the service coordinator. So when a physician writes an order, whatever the order is, there are people that all they do is make sure that that order is flawlessly executed on time exactly as, as, as written. So in this command center, you have three types of physicians. You have nurses, APPs, and service coordinator 24 seven, 365. You're the patient or you're the family member and you have someone at home that's being hospitalized. Unlike a hospital, Natalie, 24 seven, you can talk to your entire team. You can see your entire clinical team. In a hospital at one o'clock in the morning, if you wanted to know the status of your, your, your loved one's health, or if you wanted to talk to a doctor, good luck. In our mm -hmm. model, 24 seven, bi-directional access to the clinical team. So that's the first principle. The second principle is tethering. The clinicians in the field act as the arms and legs of the command center. Unlike sending someone in independently with their license and saying, all right, nurse practitioner, all right, nurse, figure out what you need to do and then do it. That's not the model. The model is the physicians are actually providing the care using these tethered clinicians in the field. Why? Because these are very high acuity ill patients. They're not low acuity patients that you could schedule care for. These require 
rapid response, rapid understanding led by physicians. So that's the command center. In our business model, we enable health systems to actually become a command center. We have, I think, 17 or some large number and they're growing very, very quickly around the country. And those command centers provide care for their own patients. So Mayo Clinic is an example, Kaiser Permanente is an example. Their clinicians are providing care for their patients enabled by our model. So that's the command center. Those are the field clinicians. The third, in the home, if the physician who's in the command center is needing to feel comfortable about the status of the patient, they need vital signs. They need to see the patient. They need to talk to the patient. They need access to the family. They need durable medical equipment. They need backup power in the event there's a blackout. They need backup cell signal. They need backup uh, high-speed internet access. They need everything that would turn that home into a temporary medical surge unit rapidly in under 40 minutes. So the home and the tech in the home and the equipment in the home, all of that has to be integrated, curated, integrated, dispatched, installed, and tested in under 40 minutes to make the home a temporary hospital unit. So you have that tech connected to the command center and you have the field clinicians connected to the command center, all operated and supervised by a software system, which we call SESIA, C-E-S-I-A, which I shamelessly named after my mother. Mm. Uh, and, and SESIA reminds all of us and our customers that we're taking care of our mothers there's nothing more important to understand that these are human beings. These are not workflows. These are not transfers. These are not handoffs. These are human beings that require healing and love and caring the way you would for your own mother. So Seisha runs this entire hospital model. The field clinicians deliver the care supported by the physicians in the command center and the tech in the home is integrated to allow this to happen. That's the model. You can't remove or change any one of those four things. They're a system. Unlike a hospital, which has many, many siloed capabilities, this is fully integrated from start to finish. And the last piece of this is we don't believe in a four and a half day length of stay um, patient episode. We believe the patient is sick until they're clinically stable and they have a clinically stable endpoint. There's no such thing in our vernacular as post-acute care. That's a, a reimbursement artifact. You're sick until you're not sick. And you're typically sick longer than the four and a half days in the hospital, which is why this is such a dramatic use of skilled nursing facilities and a dramatic use of readmissions. So that's the readmissions and the skilled nursing facility usage demonstrate that the hospital business model doesn't work for patients. It may work financially for the hospital, but it doesn't work for patients. And until the hospital is truly penalized for readmissions and for other issues in, in a way that's significant, the model will continue. So. All together, the ecosystem is the four things, the command center, the field clinicians, the tech in the home and the software, and a series of clinical decisions we made on how to care for patients that are superior in our view to the way in which we do it in the siloed manner using the hospital as a platform. There's a mouthful of stuff that I just shared with you, but that's basically the model. It's incredibly complex and honestly, kudos to you for even trying to attempt this. This is brilliance. And, you know, I, you know, this is really something to be, to be, you know, understood. Um, I, you know, and there's all kinds of challenges and I, I can't even probably begin to dismantle some of these and to uncover everything that you've probably had to endure. Um, I guess, Ultimately, you started this concept 13 years ago. The model is is really solid with this almost this triad, this this triad that has to work together. You've also mentioned that these are very acutely, you know, patients with really acute um, and very important and very dire condition. And it sort of makes sense that somebody would go through this level of complexity and cost to enable this to happen within somebody's home. Suddenly, we're presented with COVID. And the world is flipped on its head. And now everything has to be done at home. Tell us how that dire, you know, majorly acute condition situation and all the, you know, the way the triad works with, you know, your the command center, the software, and then the whole supply chain piece. Has it been optimized? Was it modified to now include all dimensions of healthcare and conditions? What happened and changed? since COVID? Great, what a great question. Um, 
So the driver, first the driver, Natalie, of the change was we don't have a flexible high acuity care delivery system. We have a fixed system because it's rooted in facilities, which means I have a hospital with 25 ICU beds, an ED with 20 bays, and here comes 500 people with COVID. <laughs> what do I do? I, I don't have a system when one hospital is full, all the other hospitals are being monitored for their status and integrated. So I have an immediate ability to transfer. I also don't have a system to move the patients out that could be cared for at home to make room for COVID patients. I did have a system for canceling elective surgery to make capacity. However, however, that's the only real place hospitals make money. So we, we really created a lot of financial issues for hospitals across the country and we stopped elective surgery. And the nurses and the capacity of those nurses from the elective surgery were not trained to care for patients on respirators in ICU. So there was just such a rapid and, and heroic response, but it really wasn't really thought through because the model of care for high acuity patients is rooted in a building. And then if you remember back in the first wave, you know, in New York City, we took a convention center and thousands of, of cots and beds, none of which were used. We had a ship come into port, none of it was used because no one thought through the systemic issues involving delivery care. So first you have this massive onslaught to a fixed capacity system when it needed flexible capacity, <clears throat> point one. Point two, once we had a better understanding of the disease itself, because in the beginning, we put everybody on respirators and a lot of people died from the respirator. <clears throat> Until we had a really good understanding that remdesivir and, and other parts of the clinical intervention were reliable and predictable, we didn't really know what to do predictably. But it didn't take a long time, we finally knew what to do. Once we knew, absent the need for a respirator, the first dose of remdesivir done in the hospital, particularly in the ED, was administered, and then we took the patient home. And then we took the patient home, and typically the, the, the mode of care was five to 10 days, and they were, they were recovered, <clears throat> and that drove an enormous amount of volume to us. Point one. Point two, hospitals that were our customers that we were partnered with who had patients with you know, CHF, COPD, cellulitis, pneumonia, conditions that were very, very close into our skill set, we moved them out of the hospital so for, to make room for the patients that were, had COVID and were really, really very sick. So what COVID did, <clears throat> not just for us, but for the country, woke everybody up that unless you have a flexible system to respond to rapid changes in demand, you really don't have a healthcare delivery system that is, is friendly to the reality of the world we live in today. And, and unfortunately, pandemics and public emergencies are not something that's gonna go away for the foreseeable future. So it woke up everybody, oh my goodness, we need a more flexible system to bring capacity online. And what better than to use the 130 million homes as our beds? And that was what drove kind of the current level of interest, my belief, many other things contributed, but that was the big one. We do not have a flexible system. We need a flexible system. So projecting into the future, Raphael, which is gonna be really interesting as we start to think about an aging society, we do see that this you know, increase, there's gonna be an inflection point of people who are going to be needing healthcare. We're seeing all of these costs going up, including drugs and other interventions and hospitalizations. What are you predicting is going to happen? Now this idea, you know, and again, Canada is very different here is that we have major limitations with ICUs in a much more robust way than you ever experienced in the US just because of our healthcare systems and the way it's paid for. Having said all of that, everybody, most of all, have a bed in their home. So this whole idea of being limited by ICU beds is potentially no longer going to be an issue. Then it comes down to the issue of the caregivers. You know, people are usually affiliated, you know, either through a, a direct person they know or somebody, as you're saying, through the command center of somebody who can manage them within their home. What is What are you predicting, especially in light of artificial intelligence, wearables, technologies in the home, Nest, this whole concept around point of care changing in the home? What is your prediction of what your service, what you're doing, the virtual hospital is going to look like in the next 10 to 20 years. So I'm smiling because we had a meeting this morning with our whole team to talk about that question. I don't believe 
that I qualify as a visionary of the future. I also don't believe in visionaries. Uh, I believe that if you have a clear understanding of what needs to get done and you're an engineer, you just do it. Once we knew we had to go to the moon, we just went to the moon <laughs> where a lot of things were complicated than medically home that had to be overcome uh, from a technology standpoint than, than medically home. Uh, so I'm not gonna predict the future. I'm gonna tell you what the future is going to be because that's exactly what we're going to do. And we have the partners to do it. So first we are going to not talk about virtual hospitals or hospitals anymore. We're gonna talk about decentralizing healthcare the same way Amazon decentralized retail. We're going to bring everything to the patient because the biggest issue with healthcare is access. We do not have, in Canada, having gotten injured in Canada a few years ago skiing, Canada is not the most friendly place if you need care right away. In fact, you gotta get online and sometimes the line is months long. It's probably the most vivid example of that in the UK, the National Health Service, of what happens when you have an integrated system that still isn't friendly to the needs of patients. So first we're gonna decentralize the care and we're gonna design all the systems to drive the care to the patient where they live. And by the way, it may not be their home. They may be poor and they may be in a, in a setting that's not friendly. So we're gonna create respite sites. They could be motels, they could be churches with communities deeply involved, but we will bring the care to wherever the patient is. We are not gonna force the patient to come to the building, number one. Number two, it has to be 24 seven. The reason hospitals are so convenient is because they're always open. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Amazon's always open. You know, Amazon never closes. So it has to be brought to the patient. It has to be 24 seven. Three, it's gonna be all of healthcare, primary care, specialty care, hospital care, nursing home care will all be brought to the patient. It's not a virtual hospital. It's a wholesale transformation of the healthcare deliveries. And we're doing it. We're doing it now across the country. Um, we, we've done transfusions in home. We've done transplants. We've done an extraordinary number of things to demonstrate the flexibility of this chassis or platform to deliver care. So I predict in the next 10 years, 30% of all people are in a hospital. 30% of all people that go to the emergency department will be cared for where they are and they will never have to go to a place, again, it'll be come to them. 70% will still require facilities-based care, like someone that has complicated surgery. That's, that's still gonna happen in an operating room. However, when they're coming out of surgery, they're gonna be cared for at home, not in a hospital. So the vast majority of transformational things that'll happen will be enabled by technologies, like you mentioned, like AI, like wearables, except the cart and the horse. The horse, What's leading this is the ability to use the home safely to deliver care. The, the stuff that comes afterwards, the technology, it's not enabling medically home. We are enabling it. I, I had visitors from Israel this week with a really provocative sensor technology, printed circuits that go on your skin that monitor everything, $40. It was so impressive. And I asked them why they started to develop it. It's because we now realize we can go to the home. So it's, it's not the tech enabling us, it's us enabling the tech. When I say us, the movement to decentralize care. So my prediction is not based on guessing what's gonna happen. My prediction is exactly what we're doing and we're well-funded and we have great partners. We are gonna move care from facilities to patients' home. We are gonna have technology companies follow us and innovate behind us to drive those solutions that we're leading. And that's, that's my prediction. I love it, it is so incredible. We've got Alexas, we've got Nests, we've got, you know, we're starting to see flying cars and taxis and the new ambulances and all kinds of things. However, there's a gap about where we are today and what you are projecting in 10 to 20 years. What do we need to do as a society, as companies, as collaborators to fill in that gap to enable the, the plan of what you're envisioning? So I, I guess I would call it pull, P-U-L-L, -L, pull. So we had a big piece done on us on the Today Show in the United States, and which is a really popular morning TV show. And, and we showed a very complicated liver patient who has a son who has pretty advanced um, autism, who did not want to be in the hospital and, and we're caring for him at home. And we showed that and then, you know, a, a, an onslaught of people reached out, how come I don't have this? I, can, I can't get this. 
And this year, I don't, I'm familiar with the Rose Bowl parade in the United States on New Year's Day. So we have a gigantic float at the Rose Bowl parade and it has all of the companies and patients that we are affiliated with in this parade. And we're now, we're, to enable this model, to answer your question, how do you fill the gaps? Patients have to demand it. Uh, mm. Once they do that, everything will fall in line. It's already started. So my, my view is it's not a technology problem. It's not a financial problem. It's a problem of the providers of care finally listening to what patients want and need and delivering it. And the louder the voice, <clears throat> the, the larger the voice, the faster this transformation will happen. So it's pull. It's patients pulling this as consumers for the solution that they know they want. And by the way, every provider, every provider, every doctor, every CEO, every nurse, when you show them the model and you have them interview patients that we care for, the first thing they say is, that's what I want for my mother. That's what I want for me. Unfortunately, I'm trapped in a model that I have to keep my hospital full for all the financial reasons we understand. But when you talk to them as individuals, as human beings, there isn't one that has ever said to me, wow, that's a bad idea. So it's so, it's so interesting that you say that, Raphael, and it's, it's interesting because it, it kind of brings me back to our earlier part of our conversation when you were saying when you first suggested this idea to some of your friends who are running hospitals, yes, this sounds great, but. So the next question is, this sounds great, but is, are you concerned about what I call legacy frameworks, old, old thinking, um, things Not like anymore. that? Is there, is there almost an issue around almost like the, you know, the burning of the forest and then, you know, the rising of the phoenix and the ashes. Is it going to require that level of, dis, you know, disruption? What needs to happen so these naysayers, and the only reason I'm saying this, and I'm sure we're all aware of this, is that never before have I ever understood so many shades of, of, of gray of what truth is since, since COVID. There's, there's a myriad, I always thought there was a single truth, but you know, apparently there's multiple versions of reality according to what dimension you're looking at. So depending on if you're a conspiracy theorist or not, I mean, who's pushing against this and what needs to happen for us to kind of make this, make a reality? I'm, I'm a person of faith. Um, so I default to uh, the belief that the real system, the ecosystem that we live in is a whole series of connected, um, you know, energies, intelligence, all um, integrated on behalf of, of a journey that we're on together. I believe every individual in that collective has a responsibility to take the gifts they were given to move the entire thing forward. My insanely, uniquely crazy career uh, uniquely prepared me to do this. And I don't believe that's an accident. So when I made some of the decisions I made at the time, my family, my friends looked at me and said, well, why are you doing that? Um, and I just said, I don't know. It just feels right. It feels right. Now, Mayo Clinic, Kaiser Permanente, a very long list of, of partners are driving this now, not me. And the fact that Mayo Clinic is saying, this is the better care, the best way to do it, <clears throat> the, the, the movement has started. So I don't think legacy thinking is going to survive the onslaught of academic clinical leaders saying, sorry, that's not the way, right way to do things anymore. I think, Natalie, that's over. That's in, in using Malcolm Gladwell, the tipping point has happened. The real next question is how loud are the voices that want this called patients? <clears throat> and um, I fundamentally believe, I was telling one of my colleagues this morning when I was six, I got a gift in the mail, it was a baseball bat, glove, and, and a ball from a sailor, a neighbor of ours that was on, a, on an aircraft carrier. And it was my first gift in the mail in a package with string. And I remember the mailman brought it and it had my name on it and how excited I was to get that in the mail. That's exactly what happens to every single patient that's cared for at home. Mm. Um, and, and do you hear the story of how this really began with my mom? Do you know the story of why the I home? I read it, it's beautifully yeah. written on your website. Yeah, so so that, that's the idea is when the care comes to your home, when the healer comes to your home, it is a transformative experience. And since every human on the planet is a patient at some point in their life, there isn't anybody in the addressable market. Everybody is a patient at some point or their family member is a patient. The feeling of that clinician, that healer coming into your home, seeing your pain, your suffering, your vulnerability, and putting their energy and their love into you where you live 
in that healing environment, that, that sanctuary, there's nothing more powerful in the world. We don't need to promote that. We just need to let it happen. And that's exactly what's happening now. Uh, but it took, it took 13 years, 13 years of just believing that this was the right answer and just being patient, not pushing it, just being patient. It's almost like you've created the medically home flywheel. So once the momentum starts, we're, we're just going to see a crescendo. Uh, I think it's so interesting about what's old is new again. And I think, you know, back in the day, there used to be physician visits and now we're revisiting, but in a, in a new and re revived way. A lot of people who listen and watch our show are from the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I'm just curious about partnerships, you know, people like payers, uh, pharmaceutical companies, others. What would they do to be part of this? What would be partnership ideas that you would have with them working with Medically Home? We're working with a whole host. We're gonna be making an announcement a week or so after Thanksgiving of seven new very large partnerships. The ones we've announced like Mayo and, and Kaiser and Cardinal Health and others, we've made them, but some big announcements are coming. Um, the framework, the framework of how these very large entities interact in the market today is based again on the facilities-based care approach. It's based on reimbursement that's dependent on the facilities. So my, my view is anyone who's delivering care through a partner, so let's say it's a pharma company selling IV medication to a hospital, will have to rethink where that patient's getting the care. We'll have to rethink the systems that surround that patient Everything from this, a simple example would be today, a, a clinician in the hospital trying to put a line in for an IV is, is poking around, you know, putting a little alcohol on the site and putting in, you know, putting in a, a syringe to get into the patient. That's how my dad died. It was the patient, the, my, my dad's needle fell out in the ICU. There was MRSA in the ICU. They pushed the needle back in and he got septic and he passed away. So. There are technologies, very basic technologies today, where the needle itself could be guided by a sonogram and the person actually providing the needle, doing that first stick can see exactly where the needle is to go exactly into the patient's arm. That becomes really important as you decentralize care and you have thousands, hundreds of thousands of clinicians in the field, obviously providing vascular access. That's one really profoundly obvious example of how the care is gonna change because we now decentralized it versus centralizing it. So there are almost countless examples of how we changed the care because we've changed the site of the care. And all of those companies you're talking about, pharma, there's a whole series, of, we're partnered with all of them today, and that's what we're gonna announce in November. And all of them recognize that the site of care change is gonna drive a care delivery change inside of their core industry. They all recognize that already. This is not new news to them and they're driving. A wonderful book written that I just, I've always blown away by it, The Fourth Turning. Uh, I'm sure you've probably heard of it. Neil Howe and William Strauss wrote, wrote the book. And I kind of feel like we're in this, this, this time of the great unraveling. Um, we're seeing supply chain issues and uh, people, that, they're calling it the era of the great dispersion and the great resignation. Is this just a shuffling of people? Um, is, should people be afraid of what the future looks like and afraid of their jobs. And, you know, is this, you know, or is this a time and an era of opportunity? You're a very thoughtful person with a great intellect. So I thank you for the question. Um, I believe the world could only be viewed through one of two lenses. One lens is abundance and the other is scarcity. The way you get people to kill each other, have, have war, pestilence is through creating the impression that we're a world of scarcity and there's a fixed amount of resources available. And if my kid doesn't get into that school, um, he's gonna be poor and I better make sure he gets into that school. If there's only 10 pounds of corn, I better get two pounds now or else I'm gonna starve. And then my neighbor who owns the corn says, well, I have to go buy a gun to protect that corn. So in a scarcity mentality, there is a need to protect and defend the legacy model. In an abundance mentality, there's no limit to what you can create because we were given the gift of innovation, creativity, int intelligence. So I'm of the mind that this is an abundant world. I'm of the mind that there's a God that wants it to be an abundant world. 
And I think the pandemic is not COVID, it's scarcity. The pandemic is ignorance, scarcity, and polarity. And that's what I believe. So I, the shifting of the sands have happened many, many times over the many generations of the human experience. There's never been a stable period for more than 50 years of anything. To your question, we are having another shift. Technology is accelerating it, but the big fear that's going on right now is the polarity that's been created in the political climate, uh, which I think is very troubling. But if you have an abundant mentality, people are not worried about too many Mexicans coming in the United States because the economy is going to grow and there's going to be more things done with those people coming into the United States. So it is a really big focus challenge of mine as a leader to make sure we generate every day, every conversation, every sentence, a feeling of abundance. Every day, every conversation, every sentence. And that's how I raised my kids is to feel like this is an abundant world and your job is to make it more abundant. Uh, not I love it. Yeah. I love it. It's a, a homo deus uh, um, view. It's a Peter Diamandis view. I absolutely love that you're just filled with that spirit. I'm thinking about Viktor Frankl's um, Man's Search for Meaning and the whole idea around logotherapy. And so at the end of the day, I think this is just, this is one of the biggest ideas. I absolutely love it. I just want to say I have so much respect for what you're doing. I just want to follow very carefully. And again, the mind and the inspiration that's coming from your mother and father in this. So this is obviously going to be a long-term play and, uh, and a passion. So very exciting. And I love how you're pioneering this. I'm really, really excited. Uh, I wish I could talk to you for hours because I think you're full of so many other incredible wisdoms. Um, and uh, maybe that would be for another show. But for... Um, I. For anybody who's actually watching this, if you're interested in collaborating, speaking, finding out more about how to get involved, I'm hoping this one day will become a, a global idea, something hopefully that will come to Canada as well. Um, we will be leaving Raphael's contact details in the show notes below, so please check that out. If you're interested in this kind of conversation, this is exactly the kind of stuff that we do. Check out impetusdigital.com. We actually get people to work together on figuring out new you know, policies, procedures, systems thinking through our asynchronous and synchronous touch points that we work with you, your collaborators, your payers, patients, to get these kinds of new ideas beyond um, just uh, you know, from, a, from a conception standpoint. Check out impetusdigital.com. We'd love if you can like and subscribe to our channel and please leave a review on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Raphael, this was an outstanding conversation. We thank you so much. Pleasure. My pleasure.